So we're going to start with a competing species model, like last time, but it's going to be modified a bit. Competing species model, where the growth in the absence of the other species is going to be logistic instead of exponential. It's a problem in the book. It's 11.9 number 18. The system of differential equations consists of dx dt equals x times 1 minus x over 2 minus xy, and dy dt equals y times 1 minus y over 3 minus xy. You should be able to think about this from an idea, conceptual perspective, qualitatively, to say that, for example, in the absence of the other species, if y is 0, I could ignore the second equation, ignore the second term in the x equation, and look at that and say, hey, that's a logistic model with k equal to 1, that's the coefficient in front, and the carrying capacity L equal to 2. That's what you're dividing the variable by. Right. So in the absence of the other species, x should approach 2. We saw that with the logistic model that you approach the carrying capacity unless you start off with a population of 0. On the flip side, if x is zero, making the first equation go away and making the second term in the second equation go away, that's also a logistic model for y, but now with the carrying capacity of three instead of two. Okay, how is that gonna affect things? It should have some sort of effect. Then you say, okay, I do have these interaction terms both with negative coefficients. That's why this is a competing species model because both coefficients of the x times y term are negative. And then we want to try to draw the phase plane, ideally without technology, if we can. For the purposes of both using Mathematica and analyzing things, especially if you take Diffie-Q with linear algebra, we give these functions names. They are multivariable multi functions, f of x, y, and g of x, y. To find the null clines, you set those functions equal to zero. If they're both equal to zero simultaneously, you solve for x and y, you get the equilibrium points. For that purpose, it is good to factor as much as possible. And actually problem 18 in the book writes this in factored form right away. But I, will, I like writing it this way first. In the first right-hand side, the f function, factor out a common factor of x. There's an x there, there's an x there. What's left over is a one minus X over two, just like you see right here, but also a minus Y. In the dy dt equation, you can factor out a common factor of Y. And what's left over is one minus Y over three minus X. Set both expressions equal to zero to solve for equilibrium points. To solve or equilibrium points. And we did that first with the example on Monday before we solve for the null clines, but this time let's do it the reverse order. Let's solve for the null clines first and then the equilibrium points. Conceptually speaking, that's technically a better way to go because it emphasizes that where the distinct null clines cross, those are the equilibrium points. So for, focus first on the X null cline. What is the x null cline represent? Null means zero, cline means curved line. But our null clines for our example so far have been straight lines, but in general, they could be curved. It's where dx dt is zero. Zero corresponds to the word null. Based on the right-hand side function being called f, that's equivalent to f of xy being zero. What's the set of points where that expression equals zero? It's a curve in general, or maybe in this case, it's two lines that intersect at a certain point. Call the level curve of the function f in multivariable calculus, a place where it equals a constant. In this case, the constant is zero. Based on the formula for f in factored form, that's equivalent to x times in parentheses one minus x over two minus y being zero. 
which happens when x is zero, which is the y-axis, and also happens when this thing is zero, one minus x over two minus y being zero, which if you solve for y is the line y equals negative x over two plus one, a line with a slope of negative one half and a y-intercept of one. On the other hand, the y oak line is where dy dt is zero. Sorry, that's a t there. Which occurs where the g function is zero. Which, if you look at the factored expression for g, occurs when this expression equals zero. I'm going to switch around where the x is and where the y is because we typically like having x first and y second. But it's still the same expression. That's going to occur when y equals zero, which is the x-axis, or one minus x minus y over three equals zero, which if you solve it for y in a couple steps here, that's equivalent to y equals um, negative three x plus three. I just added y over three to both sides to get y equals negative x plus one. And then I multiply both sides by three to get y equals negative three x plus three. Now draw these null lines in the phase plane. Phase planes, by the way, are, are actually more commonly called phase portraits in the phase plane. We're most interested in where X and Y are both positive. We're most interested in the first quadrant. I'll draw it about like this. X horizontal, Y vertical. All right, start with the X node line. It consists of two lines. Back up here, the X node line, first of all, consists of X equals zero, which is the vertical Y axis. It also consists of this line, a line with a slope of negative one half and a y intercept of one, about like this. The x intercept would be positive two. If you plug in positive two there for x, you get zero for y. So if this happens to be one right here, and this is two right there, one milk line is the slanted line with slope of negative one half and a y-intercept of one, and x-intercept of positive two. The other one, again, was the y-axis. So I'll sort of redraw over the y-axis in red here. Those are the two lines on which the vectors in the vector field, the arrows in the vector plot makes, point vertically, either straight up or straight down. So if you're on the y-axis, You got to stay on the y-axis. If x is zero, it stays zero. Do the arrows go up or down? Let's figure that out later. But you would have upward or downward pointing arrows along the y-axis. Along this other one, you got upward or downward pointing arrows as well. I draw little line segments pointing up and down to remind myself that I got to cross that x and incline with vertical tangents. If a solution curve crosses, it's got to cross with the vertical tangent, either going up or going down, one or the other. That's the x null claim. What about the y null claim? It consists of two lines as well, y equals zero, which is the horizontal x-axis. And this line with a slope of negative three and a y-intercept of positive three. The x-axis is a y null claim. So if you start in the x-axis, you got to stay on there. The, Arrows in the vector field will be horizontal, rightward pointing or leftward pointing. But also this line with a y-intercept of three and a slope of negative three, which will mean that it crosses with an x-intercept of positive one. It'll look about like this. Got to cross that with horizontal tangents, make a bunch of little horizontal lines. Where red and green intersect, where X and Y and Oakland intersect are equilibrium points. 
One place where red and green intersect is the origin, right? The y-axis I tried to make red, the x-axis I tried to make green. A little hard to see with the colors. Another place where red and green intersect is up here, zero three. Another place where red and green intersect is right here, two zero. Another place they intersect, maybe the most interesting place is right there. Hmm. It's hard to tell what the coordinates of that are. X is a little less than one. Y is close to 0.5, it looks like. But that's based on how accurate my drawing is. Are these two points, one zero and zero one equilibrium points? No, because that point, two red lines are crossing, not a red and a green. In this point, two green lines are cross crossing, not a red and a green. The vector field is still vertical there, with non-zero length to the arrow and horizontal there with non-zero length to the arrow. At the equilibrium points, technically the vector field is just the zero vector, it's just a dot because both dx dt and dy dt are zero. Equilibrium points do correspond to what are called equilibrium solutions. For example, take that point right there, whatever its x coordinate is, x as a function of t would be a horizontal line at that value of x, maybe close to 0.9. y as a function of t close to 0.5 would be a horizontal line for that y coordinate. I'm not drawing those horizontal lines. I'm only imagining them. I could draw them. I'm choosing not to bother. The equilibrium points do can be drawn as regular graphs of regular functions of t, horizontal axis t, vertical axis either x or y, depending on which one you're thinking about. The graphs are horizontal lines, that's equilibrium. All right, but now we have to fill in the rest of the phase portrait, and we also should solve for the equilibrium points. Pretty clearly, it looks like 0, 0, 0, 3, and 2, 0 are three equilibrium points. Can that be verified looking at the equations? Yes. For example, let's think about zero three when X is zero and Y is three. Go back up here. I'll go back up to the original equation. When X is three, zero and Y is three. X being zero makes that zero, which makes the product zero. So yes, the right-hand side of the DX to T equation is zero when X is zero. Y equals three does make the second equation zero as long as x is zero. You know, y is three doesn't make that zero, but if y is three and x is zero, I get one minus three over three minus zero. One minus one minus zero is zero. So yes, when x is zero and y is three, both of these are zero, making both of these derivative zero, and the solution stays where it starts. Likewise, if x is two and y is zero, y is zero, you get zero there. If x is two and y is zero there, you get one minus one minus zero, zero. But what is this other equilibrium point? I've got to solve for where both of these are zero, ignoring for when these two things are zero, I can just focus on these expressions being both zero simultaneously. Effectively, I could, for example, take this equation and plug it into this equation in place of y and solve for x. And then once I've got x, I can find y. So if I do that, what will I get? Well, I get negative x over two plus one equals negative three x plus three. I'm trying to solve for where both of these equations are true at the same time, the same location for x and y. I just replaced y with how it depends on x for this equation. Solve for x, solve for x, solve for x. Um, add 3x to both sides. Subtract 1 from both sides. 3 minus a half is 2 and a half, or 5 halves. The 1's cancel. Here, the 3x is cancel. It gives 2. Looks like x is 2 times 2 fifths, which is 4 fifths. 0.8, not 0.9, 0.8.
the first coordinate of that point is 0. 0.8. What about the second coordinate? Take 0.8, 4 fifths, and plug it into either one of these equations for y. Doesn't matter which one. Should get the same thing. I plug it into the first one up here. I'll do it as negative as 0 0.8. Negative 0 0.8 over 2 plus 1 is negative 0 0.4 plus 1 is positive 0.6. If I plugged it into this equation, I got to get the same thing. I'll just, I'll just do that in my head. Negative 3 times 0. 0.8 is negative 2.4. Plus 3 is 0. 0.6. Yes. Same thing. So the second coordinate of that is 0. 0.6. should feel comfortable with fractions too. 4 fifths, 3 fifths. Remember the units of the variables could be like thousands of animals or even millions. You're dealing with bugs, for example, it's probably be in the millions, if not billions for that matter. So we aren't talking fractions of a bug here. We're talking four fifths of a million, perhaps 800,000 bugs. All right, what is, what does the rest of the solutions look like? The temptation is just go ahead and use technology, but we can think about it without technology. But you have to listen carefully. What do you do? You think about these this these lines break up the first quadrant into four regions here, 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 and here. Think first up here. What characteristic do the points up there have? Both x and y are relatively large. Go back up to the differential equation. When x and y are both relatively large positive numbers, those are always positive, so you don't have to think about those. What are the signs of these two expressions in parentheses? They are negative because you got one minus large positive numbers. Positive times negative, positive times negative is negative in both cases. dx dt and dy dt are both negative. That means solutions are decreasing. The derivatives are negative. Both for x and y, solutions move to the southwest. x and y decrease over time. On the flip side, if x and y are both positive but small, then you've got one minus small positive numbers. If they are small enough, these differences will still be positive. And positive times positive, positive times positive gives you positive in both cases. X and Y increase. Northeast pointing arrows. Yeah, I mean, you could pick particular points if you wanted to and plug them in. You could certainly do that. That's fine but you can also just think about it. If you're over here, x is pretty close to zero, but y is somewhat further from zero. x is pretty close to zero, but y is somewhat further from zero. That gets a little trickier. Uh, maybe you want to try a particular value of x and y. Like if x is 0.1 and y is two, say, if x is 0.1 and y is two, dx dt is definitely negative. On the other hand, if x is 0.1 and y is 2, 1 minus 2 thirds is positive, minus 0.1 is still positive. This is positive. And you can check other points. dx dt is going to be negative, dy dt will be positive. That means northwest pointing arrows. x decreases and y increases. And in this little triangle down here, it would be southeast pointing arrows like that. Just drawing these arrows now helps you draw all the other solutions. If you have an initial condition up here, say, where x is pretty small and y is somewhat larger, you got to go to the northeast, and it looks like you're probably going to cross this red line. You have to cross it with the vertical tangent line. The velocity vector of the solution curve at that point has got to be an upward pointing arrow. I could draw arrows for the vector field along that red line there. They'd be upward pointing over here and actually downward pointing over here. And then you're kind of, well, you're forced to head up toward that equilibrium point, it seems. And in fact, that's true. And if you were on the y-axis to begin with and x was zero, remember both y and x grow logistically 
approaching the carrying capacities, and three was the carrying capacity for Y. And you'd have downward pointing arrows up here along the Y axis. And initial conditions up here would also go down at first, because you got to move to the southwest when you're up here. They'd be going down, 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 and cross that green line horizontally before, I guess, heading up toward that point again. Even down here, with that initial condition, you're going to head up toward that point. Cross that green line with a horizontal tangent. I, I didn't draw it very well. Try your best to draw this reasonably. Try to draw at least cross these milk lines with appropriate tangent lines. On the flip side, if you start way down here, where Y is really small, you're still going to the Northeast in this region, but now you're gonna cross this green line horizontally before heading to the Southeast and I guess approaching that equilibrium point. And yeah, two is the equilibrium for the logistic model for X when Y equals zero. Over here, with that initial condition, you do something like this. I mean, the picture gets tough to draw at some point. But you kind of get the idea. Isn't it amazing that all the solution curves are sort of getting squeezed up toward one or the other equilibrium point? Mathematically, that is what is happening, amazingly. Um, what is the meaning of this for real life? Again, don't take it too literally, but it, what the model is predicting is that maybe, just maybe, still one or the other species dies off. If you approach this one, then X dies off to zero. If you approach this one, then Y dies off to zero. And once again, the boundary between the two is pretty fine line here. There are separatrix solutions that do go straight toward that equilibrium point where both animals live, but it's not very stable a small change in your initial condition greatly affects what happens. Very sensitive dependence on what the initial condition is. Slightly above that, you uh, X will die off. Slightly below that, Y will die off. Doesn't seem like there's a happy ending for both species. Again, is this reality? In general, it's not reality. It's kind of a picture of what could happen. So you kind of approach reality with caution, you might say, if you're a conservationist trying to keep competing species both alive. I don't know, maybe you feed them both so they both stay alive, but I don't, it's a picture of what might happen. Let's confirm this with Mathematica. We've got the right-hand side functions F and G can be entered. If we want, we can confirm we've got the right equilibrium points for solving for where those are both zero simultaneously. You need double equal signs. Solving for X and Y simultaneously. Zero, zero, two, zero, zero, three, and yes, four fifths, three fifths. Contour plot inside the show will make the, the null clines. Where f is zero, that's where dx dt is zero, that'll be in red, just like I drew by hand. And where g is zero, that's where dy dt is zero, the y null line, that will be green, just like I drew by hand. You could draw the vector plot. Might as well just draw the stream plot to see the actual solution curves. And list plot with these four dots represents the equilibrium points. That will draw big dots at the equilibrium points. And I did not make a manipulate, no unspecified parameters here. So I will not make an animation, but there you see what we drew by hand. This green line is the x-axis. This red line is the y-axis, where red and green intersect here, 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 and here are your equilibrium points. We see solutions up here moving toward that one, no matter which side you start on. Down here, they head toward this one. It does appear that we got a separation solution going about like that. The one coming down from here is not shown. That's just because you don't, you know, the 
computer is not plotting enough points, essentially. Are those separatrix solutions straight lines? It's possible, though in general, you should not assume that. This one does look pretty straight, but in general, you should not assume they're straight lines. Technically speaking, mathematically, you never actually reach the equilibrium points. You just approach them asymptotically as t goes to infinity toward this sink, for example, or this sink. Or as t goes to minus infinity, for this point is really a source. The arrows are moving away from it. It's a source. You would approach that as t goes to minus infinity without actually reaching it. And um, this point that's kind of unstable is called a saddle point. In class I teach this coming fall, I call differential equations with linear algebra. The last month of the class, we were doing this a lot with lots of different situations, mostly in two-dimensional situations with phase planes, though in theory, you can do higher dimensions. You could do three-dimensional problems with three species, and your phase plane would become a phase space, and your equilibrium, equilibrium points would be three-dimensional. Or you could have four species and your phase space would be four dimensional hyperspace that you can't visualize. Except for Bart Netterfield locked himself in a room and tried to visualize four dimensions and he was not successful. Ask Dr. Beacon about Bart Netterfield. He's actually famous, famous physicist. He went, went to Bethel the same time I did. Uh, five dimensions, six dimensions, a million dimensions. Can we do math in a million dimensions? Technically, yes. Can't visualize it, but we can do math. We can try to solve equations to find equilibrium points, million dimensional equilibrium points. And we could even try to figure out, are they sink sources or some sort of higher dimensional saddle point? You can use higher dimensional calculus techniques to do that with involving vectors and matrices involving partial derivatives that you put inside matrices and maybe you take their determinants and you find their eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Linear algebra. And yeah, since you can't visualize it, you have to use something else. 